uh, just for my YouTube viewers here, welcome to the Clubhouse Report. This is Dan with another video, or a uh, audio, this is, of uh, an interview with former Texas Rangers, San Antonio Spurs, and Dallas Mavericks broadcaster and current play-by-play -play guy for the North Texas Mean Green men's basketball team. Uh, this is Dave Barnett. Welcome. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Now, before, uh, let's get started right here, right at the beginning. You went to North Texas State University. Did you major in sports broadcasting at all? I did. Um, it's pretty much all I ever saw myself doing since I was eight years old. I didn't know if I'd ever get the chance to do it, but I knew I wanted to try and be in position to have a career if I was ever fortunate enough to. Yeah, and that's something that I'm actually doing too. I'm like also an aspiring sports broadcaster, so like that's this is one of the reasons why I'm interviewing you because like I'm like I'm in that field as well and the highest level of stuff I've done is uh high school wrestling, but you know, I'm 14, so I got to I got to like work up the ranks. <laughs> You're way ahead of where I was at 14. I had done nothing. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm from a small town, so it's like once there's once people hear what you do, I guess it's uh, I guess people hear, and I guess that opportunities come up. But my father is a sports broadcaster as well. He does work for uh, semi-professional football, and um, he also did work for a uh, minor league baseball team in Wilmington, Delaware. So we it's kind of running in the family, I'd say. So okay. glad to hear well, uh, that no, you know if, that you, was... if you know what you want to do and you can think of uh, little steps to um, get you there then that's that's the whole secret absolutely and I, I mean I can imagine that it was uh, pretty interesting for you considering that you graduated from North Texas State in 1979 and then you had a job with the NBA with uh, the Dallas Mavericks just two years later in 1981. So that was, uh, I mean, you were pretty young back then, so, uh, I mean, how did that feel for you when just two years out of college, you already had a very high-level job in uh, with an NBA franchise? Yeah, um, it's obviously nothing I could have planned on or anyone could plan on. Uh, a lot of things had to break just right. The only thing I could control in all of that was to make myself as prepared as possible if any opportunity came up, I didn't. I certainly didn't think it was going to be, you know, the NBA at age 23. I was ready to be a country DJ in Amarillo, Texas, if that's the best opportunity I had out of college. And that's what my professors were telling us. You know, don't expect you're going to go right into a, a job in Dallas or Houston. You work way, your way up to that. Uh, but I had a professor who um, took an interest in me my junior year. And he found out about an opening uh, at KRLD Radio in Dallas, which had just changed their format to all news. And it was minimum wage, uh, just writing and doing tape editing. But he recommended me to the new news director, and they were so desperate, they hired me. I barely turned 20. Uh, and so I was already um, working in Dallas, and then, you know, at that point, I'm already thinking I'm 10 years ahead of where I actually realistically thought I would be. Um, and that station had a lot of sports flagship station for the Cowboys. They carried SMU, football and basketball. And so I was able to slowly get myself on the air and do some, uh, some of the sports stuff that the, uh, the two man department couldn't do, uh, cover things that they either couldn't physically get to or didn't really have any interest in, uh, and I was there for three years, and during those three years, I got to fill in on two SMU basketball games. And other than what I'd done at the campus radio station, that's all the basketball I'd done. But I'd done as much as I possibly could have. And so when the Mavericks came into business uh, their first year, their original play-by-play -play voice was uh, Mark Holtz, who was immediately hired away by the Rangers. Uh, his main interest was baseball. So that offer was presented to him. And he so it was, the, and it, was it was the Texas Rangers, not the New York Rangers. Texas Rangers. Right. And um, this happened six weeks before the Mavericks' second season was about to begin, 1981. And so the Mavericks were pretty much stuck with local people who had done basketball and were not under contract. Well, I was there. I knew the Mavericks' people because I covered 
some of the games. I had done basketball, and I was way too unimportant to be on the contract. And so based on that, they took a flyer on me at age 23. They were um, thankfully very patient because it, it took me most of that first season to catch up to the speed of the game. Um, I had to figure out a way to say in two or three words what I was saying in 10 or 12 words, and that took most of the year. Uh, but by the end of the year, I think they were satisfied enough with my progress that they decided to keep me on. I ended up um, with them for seven years. One of the people I'd worked with, who was in their marketing department, then took over uh, the entire business side of the San Antonio Spurs, made me an offer to do all television there. And so that's when I left and uh, stayed in the NBA. And it turned out I was getting with the Spurs at the point where they were about to take off. My first year there was the last bad team when they were waiting for David Robinson to get loose from the Navy. My second year there, David came, and they've been a, a great franchise. Ever since. And they won that uh, NBA title, I believe, in 1999. I'm not an expert in basketball, but, yeah, they won in 99, and I'm pretty sure you departed in 96 or 97? Yeah, their first time was 99. I left um, to go to ESPN. They made me... Um, one of these offers that you know you dream about was to do all three of my sports football basketball baseball in 1996 um and I, I came back and did part of a season with the spurs in uh 607 which was a championship year um while i was still at, at espn so uh i've got a championship ring from that spurs season which was their um fourth of their five champs yeah, the Spurs were definitely a force to be reckoned with back in those days. But you just said before, you've done three sports before, basketball, baseball, and football. Is there one sport that you are the most comfortable with in the booth out of the three? Um, probably basketball because I've done the most. Um, you know, including some um, NBA work at ESPN, around 20 years I've done basketball. Um so, yeah, I, I would probably say if, if there's one game that I'm best at, give me a basketball game. Um, I get asked a lot if there was one event I could do and it's the last event I could ever do. I, I would probably pick college football just because every college football game is such an event. And, uh, Absolutely. I mean, my, years, my years at, at ESPN, um, I spent most of it in, in the Big Ten, the SEC, some ACC. The Big 12, and there's just there's, there's nothing to match the import of uh, a big time college. Absolutely, I mean, like college basketball, they you know always sell out a crowd. Usually, even if it's like a small school against a big school, that, that like big school, it brings in everybody. It doesn't matter if it's going to be a blowout. And that same thing can be said for college football. So. Uh, what media of broadcasting do you prefer? So, like, radio or television? Like, which one are you better with? Because you've done both. Yeah, I would pre probably prefer TV just because um, I like the collaboration with 20 or 30 people, everyone doing their job, and hopefully it all comes together. Um, but the other thing I like more about TV is you can take off and tell more of an in-depth story than you can on radio. Radio, you're pretty much just locking in with what you're seeing, the basic facts of what's happening. Um, and in TV, obviously the camera is telling most of the nuts and bolts of the story, and so you can get a little more in-depth about uh, personal stories, storylines with the team, um, things that you really don't have time to get into on radio because especially on basketball it's all you can do to keep up with the action so um, I mean I enjoy them both but if I had to pick I'd probably say it. and uh, the the whole difference is that just with radio there's like you said there's like no time for broadcasters to get into anything like off topic a little bit you know like the 
like how this player you know was drafted or what college he went to because basketball is a really high paced game it's it's really fast and there's a lot of scoring so if you miss something then that's not going to be good if you're talking about you know how this player was drafted out of UCLA or something so it's uh it's definitely interesting you know how drastic of a difference there really is when it comes to downtime yeah you have more time to that doing baseball on radio especially as baseball has slowed down over the years with games taking three, three and a half, four hours. There's plenty of time for stuff like that yeah. on the radio on baseball, but less so um, than ever in football with offenses becoming so fast-paced. Even and when there's 40 good. seconds on the play clock, and in most cases you use all those 40 seconds on the play clock, but in that case it's just like that 40 seconds is just kind of taken up by cameras panning of the huddling and all that so it's not right yeah it's not a it's not too different in my opinion yeah um football's changed quite a bit because there's not nearly as much time to set up each play uh because offenses are racing to the line not even huddling in most instances and trying to get the next play off uh so it's harder to work in a partner and especially Many of my years to the ESPN, I was working with two partners, and um, at that time there was time to hear from both of the analysts between plays. Uh, that's really difficult now uh, because the, the nature of the sport has changed so much. Absolutely. Now, which type, for lack of a better term, do you prefer of broadcasting? Which would be like play-by-play or color? Because once again, you've done both and you've had significant experience with both. Yeah, the only color really was uh, my first couple years with the Rangers where I was doing radio with Barry K. Bell. And he's in the Hall of Fame, so yeah. everyone's going to be you know, fortunate to work with them. Um, and he didn't need a whole lot of analysis. Um, when he calls a play, he pretty much um, draws the full picture. So... Um, the, my job description was to be his analyst, but I, I really did my own innings the way he did his innings, which was, you know, trying to paint as, as complete a picture as possible. And if I did add something, it was just something that he couldn't see because he was looking at the ball. Um, the, the most important role for an analyst is to be the second pair of eyes, see something that the play looked like I couldn't see. So that's where I would try and chip in. I, I, you know, not having been a former player or coach or manager, I didn't do as much second guessing or even first guessing about strategy and things like that. It's more about what actually happened or what might happen and trying to give the radio audience the, the most clear picture as possible. Um, other than that, all I've done is play by play. So I, you know, I, I would never present myself as any kind of a model. Well, I mean, when you did play-by-play -play for the Rangers uh, for uh, Fox Sports and their Rangers affiliate, um, and you were partners with, I'm pretty sure, Tom Grieve, who also played in the big leagues, you know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, veteran presence in the booth with guys who played 10 years in the major leagues and a guy who graduated out of college, went to the NBA, he's going to baseball now. You know, it, it's got to feel a little bit a little bit interesting to kind of have a partnership with another sports broadcaster who actually played the game for 10, 15 years professionally. And that's one of the things I enjoy most about it is I can pick their brain about situations that they've been in and I haven't been in, but almost every one of the audience has not been in. Um, you know, what is it like to anticipate? What are you trying to figure out? Um, why did so and so react this way? Why did they do this instead of that? Uh, and uh, in a lot of instances, it really just amounts to you interviewing your partner, uh, just knowing what questions to ask and when to ask them, uh, and trying to put your your mind in the position of someone in the audience who knows less than you probably and is going to be wondering the same thing. So that's one of the things I enjoy most about it, is working with someone who can answer this type of questions. Absolutely, and you see in, at least with professional baseball, a lot of color commentators are guys who played professionally for a long time, like with me living in New Jersey being, you know, right across the bridge from Philadelphia, 
I watch the Phillies a lot, and you see Tom McCarthy, the play-by-play guy, who never played professionally, um, but you have the color commentator, which is either John Crock or Ben Davis. Both of them played in the major leagues, and then before they uh, released Mike Schmidt, because they had Mike Schmidt on for a few years as well. He's obviously one of the greatest third basemen of all time. He's got a lot of analysis, and he's got a lot of stories to tell. So it definitely helps, at least in the color commentating field, to have somebody with professional experience in that sport. Yeah, um, baseball is, is perfectly set up for that, uh, because there's so much time. There's, there's more time than there should be between pitches. And so I you need... You know, people not only who can um, fill in the blanks on what's about to happen, what just happened, why was this decision made, why was that decision thrown, but also, um, you know, the best analysts in baseball, the best storytellers, and um, guys like that never seem to run out of stories. And, and no matter what situation occurs, it will usually remind them of something in a game they played in. Um, that sometimes, you know, if it's a good enough story and a slow enough game, you can drag that out for a whole end. Absolutely. Um, we're going to get into a more serious topic now. We're going to address the on air incident of June 18th, 2012. Rangers Padres at Petco Park. So I'm going to ask if, just a few questions about that. Um, so you said that there was no memory of this particular incident. So how specifically did you find out about, like, you had this incident? I didn't find out until the next morning. Mm. Um, it was about 20 seconds or so. And it came and went so fast that uh, I, I found out later Tom Green didn't even notice it. Um, the producer of the truck noticed that something didn't sound right, but he didn't really call my attention to it. No one in the booth said anything about it. So we finished the game. Tom and I walked back to the hotel. I went to sleep. And the next morning, about 6.45, San Diego time, got a call from home. And um, my wife said, well, I guess you know you're all anyone's talking about. And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, what you said last night. I said, what are you talking about? It was a two-to-one game. Um, and she tried to describe, you know, the, the, what was being replayed at 20 or so seconds on the local newscasts, on the all sports uh, station. And then and now I have no memory of it, which I'll, I'll talk about why that is in a minute. So she tried to, you know, fill me in and describe what was going on back in the Dallas Fort Worth. And I, said, well, okay, I have no memory of that. That's really weird. So then I'm, I'm awake, so I turn on the TV, and Good Morning America comes on, and I was the third story on Good Morning America. And they played the tape, and then I finally you know, heard what everybody else had heard. And uh, I could see why people were concerned that it was some sort of stroke or you know, something medical had happened. Uh, and at that point, then, uh, my boss at Rangers called, my agent called, and they decided to get me uh, a checkup and flew me back home because uh, there were obviously some, some medical concerns that they had. So I flew back home, and I thought, well, I'll get a test or two and miss a game or two and get back on the air. Well, every test was ruling out something, and nothing was ruled in. Um, and so they were going to put me back on the air if they didn't know that it wasn't going to happen again, which I could understand. I, I could see why the Rangers didn't want to look callous, like, well, you didn't know whether this was anything serious or not. You just throw them back on there. And it happened again. Um, and so I kept getting tested for everything from brain tumor to uh, blood clot, um, you name it. And one of the tests involved being checked out for seizures at a hospital in Dallas, which has a, an entire wing about um, epilepsy. And they told me they were going to check me for that. I said, I, I don't have epilepsy. And they said, well, it may have been some sort of seizure. So they were going to keep me with electrodes on my head for a whole weekend, 72 hours. 
and study my brain waves. And after one day, one of those doctors came in and said, we're gonna let you go, you don't have seizures. He's the one doctor in six months of tests that I went under, who said, who had any familiarity with this at all. He said, I've seen this before. We don't have a name for it. We don't know what causes it. It's some sort of temporary rewiring of the circulation the circuitry and the communication part of the brain and it comes and goes and it never recurs so that was obviously good news i mean it was a relief wasn't anything serious but it was also bad news because it wasn't a diagnosis and if it never recurs then they'll never know what causes it because they can't study it it comes and goes and that's that uh, so that was a couple of weeks after it had happened. Uh, there were still some other things to rule out. And so, uh, again, it wasn't a diagnosis. And so at that point, the Rangers decided, well, we, you know, we, we need some certainty on this. So there were more tests, more things to rule out. And at, at a certain point, when everything was being, you know, uh, discounted, but there were still more things to check out, uh, the Rangers just decided, well, this, this is going to turn into a whole medical lead. We need to find out if that is a serious time. And that ended up being the rest of that season, 2012, which happened to be, unfortunately for me, the final year of my contract. And they, uh, Nolan Ryan had a um, broadcaster that worked for his minor league team at Corpus Christi, which he owned, Matt Hicks, who had been brought up to help with the reshuffling between radio and TV and no one would have sent them back down at my up. And so that was just, you know, I've had great timing for my entire career. That's the one instance of really bad time. Uh, but I still don't and never will remember it because something about the rewiring in the brain causes it not to be imprinted in your memory. Uh, and Again, it's frustrating that no one will ever really understand it because since it never recurs, you can't study it. But uh, it's now eight years later, and you know, it turned out to be correct and that it was not anything serious and it hasn't happened again, and I'm in perfect health. Absolutely. Now, looking back after you found out, did you try to like backtrack at all? Did you try to like think about previous days or events that could have led up to that? Did you think like oh, you know, like, what did I do, like, on Tuesday that could have had this terrible migraine and, you know, caused that? Like, did you did you try to backtrack a little bit? Not really, because um, that was the first diagnosis that was floated, because I, I do have migraines, and it was first thought to be um, a compound migraine, which has symptoms other than just pain. But it was also ruled out because migraines don't come and go at 27. And there are other symptoms that come with them. And this was the only thing that happened. So another thing that was uh, ruled in and then ruled out was, uh, I can't remember now, but it's basically um, a short-lived stroke. Uh, and this did have some of the aspects of that. Um, but people who have that remember it and they realize something's wrong at the time. And so that got ruled out because I didn't remember it and didn't realize anything was wrong. So, uh, that leaves, you know, just the, the, the one doctor at Parkland Hospital of Dallas who studies epilepsy and seizures and said he'd seen it and what he said turned out to be exactly right we don't know what happens it comes and goes and never recurs so eight years later it turns out he's the only guy who's been right well i did read an article from abc news that was uh reported the day after the incident um and i mean the first thing i'll say about that is that the literal title of the article said that the that this incident could have signaled a stroke i mean how did that story like if you saw that story how would have it or excuse me, how would it affect you, especially considering that you hadn't really had any tests, excuse me, tests done yet, and this was the day after, and people were already calling it a stroke? Well, that's what I would have thought, and I, I completely understood it, because 
because I didn't really know much about strokes at that point, but I did know that they have an effect on uh, speech. So I, I understood it, and, you know, based on the, the little information, not having undergone any tests at that point, um, you know, I wanted to find out the same as anybody else who have to be watching that telecast. Well, what was that? That was really strange. I've never seen that happen to someone on live television. Well... The ABC News article also stated they uh, talked to some medical experts, apparently, and um, or they had a medical expert who was also a correspondent or writer for ABC, and they talked about something called aphasia. I don't know if that was ever brought up in your tests, but it was basically, uh, for the viewers who aren't aware, it's basically a condition where you just have, like, incoherent speech and it's not a stroke because you don't remember it or anything like that and there's like kind of like two types there's like the slurred speech type where it sounds like you're drunk or just completely out of it then there's another type where you're trying to say something but then the words that you're trying to substitute they just don't come out right so i think that that might have been the closest thing to an actual diagnosis that they gave and it was aphasia Actually, I had had that happen on the air once. It was um, not doing a game. I was doing a, a sports news broadcast. And um, I knew that that was a symptom of migraines because I had a migraine that morning. And I had a hard time saying what I was trying to say. I mean, I had my copy. I was trying to read my copy. I written it. I knew exactly what I was trying to say, but uh, that particular symptom of migraines uh, messes up the connection between your eyes and your brain and your uh, speech. And so I, I knew exactly what that was because I'd experienced that. And it's a, it's a really strange, scary thing because you're not able to say what you're trying to say. Um, so that was a good guess, um, but it was ruled out because there were no other symptoms. And again, migraines don't come and go in one second. Absolutely. And... Um with that, uh, excuse me, with that previous incident, was that also an incident that you just don't remember at all, like the incident with the Rangers Padres? Uh, no, with the aphasia that happened on the air, I remember vividly, because I remember, you know, kind of a, a feeling of panic rising up, because this is happening live on the air, and I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. Why can't I say what I'm trying to say? Um, so I knew it was different because all the other symptoms were there and I remembered it and I knew it was different. Now with this previous aphasia case or just this just a case of not knowing what to say, do you remember what you said at all? Like do you remember if you said anything that was like really eye catching? Like what you said with the Rangers Padres broadcast, like did you say no. anything that was eye catching? No, it was different because, again, I was reading copy. It was just a matter of not being able to say what I was trying to say. I think it may have sounded a little bit slurred, but it was mostly just, you know, having a hard time getting words out. Um, very different from doing game broadcast where everything is extemporaneous. Um, and when I finally heard, you know, on, on Good Morning America, replay of what I've said, it struck me almost like someone talking in their sleep. Because, and, and I remember also George Stephanopoulos after they played the tape saying um, he pronounced all the words, it's just that they didn't make sense. So again, I think that's a little different than the aphasia. The aphasia, it's a little harder to pronounce them. Um, and not so much that they don't make sense. It's the struggle of getting the words out. In, in the case of the Rangers Padres game. I was pronouncing these words perfectly, but yeah. because of this, uh, you know, disturbance in the speech section of the brain, they just didn't go together and didn't make sense. And again, it, it sounds to me as I'm listening to it like someone talking in their sleep. That's that's the best I can describe it. Because honestly, when you're doing a major league broadcast, even if you are saying stuff that's incoherent speech. 
I don't really think there's any rhyme or reason to why you said fifth base, botched robbery, yeah. or henchman. So. Well, yeah, and we'll never know because you can't study this. Yeah, and um, I mean... You just see the symptoms, but you'll never know the cause. Because, I mean, unless there was an invasion by the Italian mafia during the game, I don't think there was any reason why henchmen were a part of it. But, in all uh, yeah. seriousness, it's very uh, it's very interesting to see how this can just kind of define a career. Because you did work for the Mavericks. You did work for the Spurs. You did work for, or you currently do work for the University of North Texas. But, when you search Dave Barnett on YouTube, you see the, you know, like, a few clips of the incident from 2012, which is, like, a late-night binge. That's how I found the video. Um, but when you look at Dave Barnett's Wikipedia page, it shows just a regular overview, broadcasting career, then there's a subheading that's, like, the longest paragraph in the entire uh, Wikipedia page, June 18th, 2012, on-air incident. It's really unfortunate, in my opinion, how this incident that you don't even remember has kind of, in a way, for better or worse, defined your broadcasting career. Yeah, I think that's a, a product of the time we live in. Um, if that had happened just a few years before that, things didn't go viral back then. And it was a late-night game, and you know people didn't have DVRs, and most people wouldn't have been pulling tape on it, and it would have come and gone, and they would have just thought, well, oh, did he just say? And then, you know, time would have moved on. So if that had happened at the beginning of my career, um, I'm sure it would have been discussed for a day or two, and then uh, if it never happened again, the world would have moved on. So yeah, it's, it's part of, um, you know, viral media, and um, I guess the nature of Google. I mean, I haven't checked myself out on Google or Wikipedia in a while, but I didn't know it was still that high up. But you're right. I mean, it was 20 seconds out of a 40-plus year career, and that part is a little bit frustrating because I, you know, I've called World Series, Rose Bowl, NBA All-Star Game, uh, on and what on. World, what World Series did you do? What World Series did you do? Uh, 2010. I was still working with uh, Eric Nadell on Rangers Radio. Oh yeah, because the uh, Rangers were in that one. I was th I was thinking, I was like, I was thinking of like a national scale. I was forgetting like the team to team scale. But yeah, the Rangers were in that World Series that year. Um, but you did television play by play in 2011 and 2012, or part of 2012. That is. Um, did you like when you were in there for 2011? Did you get any glimpse of the World Series when the Rangers were there as well? Uh, I, I was in the stadium for the games in Arlington. Didn't go on the road games uh, to St. Louis, so I, I wasn't there for the Nelson Cruz misplay in Game Six. Uh, I didn't work any of those games uh, because local telecasts, you know, don't have any part of postseason baseball. Unfortunate for them, but that was a great thing about local radio, calling every single game all the way through. Uh, the well, absolutely, and um, with that, the uh, 2011, what's it called, the 2011 World Series, or the 2005 World Series, that is, that was White Sox-Astros. The White Sox actually had uh, Hawk Harrelson on their play-by-play -play for the radio, so that kind of, like, that kind of, like, started, excuse me, that's <laughs> that kind of, like, started a trend over the past couple of years where we've seen television play-by-play -play during the regular season kind of evolve into radio play-by-play -play during the postseason. So that's why I asked that. Um, so during that Rangers-Padres game, is there a point where you're, like, do you remember at least some parts of the game, if not that incident? I remember everything else about the game. Is there just a point uh, where, right. is there just a point where the memory just stops and then resumes again? Yeah. It's missing just that 20 or so seconds. Remember everything else in that game, in that inning, you know, the, the post game. I remember before the game, Dick Enberg, who was doing uh, Andre's TV, paid me a visit at the booth and enjoyed visiting with him. Yeah, that's the only thing that didn't imprint in my memory. 
That's very interesting considering that, you know, I can just imagine Mike Maddox, the Rangers pitching coach, walking out to the mound, just memory stops, then Mark Kotze comes up, swings and misses at the first pitch, everything goes back to normal like nothing happened. But when you look at it from a TV standpoint, it's different than your actual, like, brain standpoint in a way. It's, uh, it's very interesting how it just kind of stops and resumes, like, you know, you're pressing uh, the pause button on your, uh, on your DVD player or something. Yeah. Um, and something else I've thought about from time to time is, so that was 20 seconds out of that day. There were 24 hours in that day. That could have happened when Tom was talking. Or between innings, when we're in commercial breaks, or when we weren't on the air, the 21 hours that day that we weren't on the air. Um, that's not how it happened. So it was um, unfortunate timing, and like you said, that yeah, it was the it was the worst possible timing. Not yeah, because I mean, you talked about you talked about worst uh, bad timing when you couldn't return for the 2012 season, but but the Rangers decided to not renew your contract. I think it's even worse timing that that uh, incident occurred when there was nothing going on, and it was kind of a crucial moment in the game. And, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, was a clip for everyone to hear. If it didn't happen during commercial breaks, we wouldn't be talking right now. Exactly. That's exactly right. Uh, one of those things that I will never get an answer for. Um, so, you know, the flip side of that is it turned out not to be anything serious medically. It wasn't a stroke. I didn't have a pain tumor or blood clot or any of those things that they checked. So, um, yeah, bad for the career, and I'll never know exactly more than what I know right now, I think. So that's just how it is and what I've had lived with. Absolutely. And um, you did football for the University of North Texas, the Mean Green, for two games during the 2012 season against South Alabama and Texas Southern, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. But when you did that first game, it was on September 4th of 2012. That was less than three months after the on-air incident. Did you feel at least a little bit nervous returning to the booth, even in a different sport, even in a different setting or level of professional sports, less than three months after you had this incident live on air? Uh, not in terms of whether I would be able to do the broadcast. Uh, I knew I would, there would be some scrutiny because there would be people watching, wondering if this was going to happen again. But at that point, it was a couple of months after I'd gotten the the word from the doctor who was checking me for uh, seizures and epilepsy, and everything else had been ruled out at that point. And so I, I wasn't um, going into with any trepidation, I was more excited to be able to demonstrate to people, look, you know, I'm still the same, this has not affected me at all, I may not ever get a diagnosis, but um, I'm still uh, able to work, that's how I look at it. Now, you still do college uh, basketball for the University of North Texas, do you still do baseball for Big 12? Uh, I would have if there had been a baseball yeah. season. <laughs> Uh, yeah, F- FS1, um, Big 12 Baseball telecasts. Yeah. Um, yeah, because there was no update on... Was canceled before, that, that was all canceled, unfortunately, before uh, the games that I would have done had, uh, had come up on. Yeah, unfortunately, there was no update on your page about uh, if you were still doing Big 12 Baseball. It just said that you took over in uh, 2013, or 2014, that is. So, that's... Uh, that's essentially that. I just didn't know if you still did that because there was no update. But you still do North Texas Mean Green uh, basketball. And considering that you still do significant work with the sports broadcasting community, do you try to stay at least more cautious now when you broadcast games considering what happened before and you don't know? No, I don't. I don't do anything differently because, again, there's nothing that I could have done to prevent that happening. And uh, it hasn't recurred again. And... You know, if anything happens to begin, it's going to be something brand new. Maybe, God forbid, I might have a stroke on the air at some point, but it won't have anything to do with um, that game in 2012. So, uh, no, it, it never has entered my mind again. 
I, I don't worry about it happening again. The doctor turned out to be right. And that Rangers Padres game in 2012, that was an interesting game in itself. The final score was two to one, and all of the scoring was in the first inning. So, because there was that two-run single from David Murphy, then there was the double from Chase Headley uh, that scored Kristen Orfia, and it was two to one. Then just eight scoreless innings of baseball. So that was a very interesting game, completely unrelated to your incident. Yeah, it was a classic National League game. You know, low scoring, pitcher's duel. Um, you know, uh, I think at the time it happened, if I remember right, Mike Adams was trying to keep a runner at first base. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, every base runner was important in that game. And we know that he did keep that runner at uh, first, or at least kept him from scoring, because that was uh, kept, like I said, it kept the score for eight innings. So, it's uh, that was an interesting game, to say the least, but the Rangers won, so that's at least an upside. So, what are you doing now in uh, in the present day, 2020, besides North North Texas and the Mean Green, besides Big 12? How are you just keeping up with the uh, with the times? Um, I think I'm doing like most people uh, are doing that are sheltering in place, um, not leaving the house much, except to go out to you know, the grocery store, the pharmacy, whatever. And, Getting out, walking around the neighborhood. Uh, I wish I could see my kids and grandkids. And uh, very little of that. I had a brand new grandbaby born. Um, they were 26. And I've seen him twice. So you know, hopefully he's not going to be walking around the <laughs> next time I see it. Uh, but I think it's 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 like everybody else is trying to find ways to keep ourselves. Um, safe, healthy, and, and occupied as best as possible. Absolutely, and uh, as, as they say, everything is bigger in Texas, but in our case, everything's bigger in Texas, even the coronavirus.